good to see you here today and appreciate your braving the uh, onset of fall to be here. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome our webcast audience and uh, just mention that it's uh, just pretty distinctive to have a webcast audience that I think is joining us from the UK as well as uh, locations in North America such as North Dakota in Houston, maybe Canada, uh, as well as other places east of the Mississippi. So uh, that's the beauty of the, the webcast and certainly like to welcome all of you uh, who are participating over the web. So today's program is part two of a two-part series on the discussion of the role of natural gas in meeting energy demand in this region and in this country uh, for the next 20 years. And uh, last month we considered uh, supply and demand and the impact of public policy on natural gas. And of course today what we're, the discussion is going to be about is the role of uh, hydraulic fracturing and uh, considering kind of the, the um, geological resources, the geographical context, the technology, and the economics of hydraulic fracturing. So, um, welcome for, for today's program. Next month's program, let me just mention that, is, uh, which will be November the 16th, is a discussion on energy supply, and the focus of the discussion will be on nuclear power, uh, the role of nuclear energy uh, post Fukushima. So uh, mark Wednesday, November 16th on your calendars for that, for that conversation. So I'm Ben Hill. I'm with Georgia Tech's Venture Lab program. And what I do is um, work with entrepreneurs, or sorry, work with faculty who happen to be entrepreneurs in starting businesses based on their research. I participate in a program with four other colleagues, and uh, we are here to support Georgia Tech faculty, staff, and graduate students in commercializing their research. It's good to, good to welcome you. I'd also like to uh, recognize a number of organizations who make this series possible and like to express our appreciation for their ongoing support of the Georgia Tech Clean Energy Series. Um, like to uh, thank Sutherland Asbill and Brennan or the law firm Sutherland for their um, support. The uh, consulting firm McKinsey and Company the uh, Georgia Tech Strategic Energy Institute, the Georgia Tech uh, Brook Byers Sustainability Program, the uh, South Face Institute, uh, the ATDC and Enterprise Innovation Institute, which, is the, which are the economic development uh, components of Georgia Tech, the, and the Georgia Tech Office of Sustainability. For those of you, um, to, so I should say, today's presentation and previous presentations are, can be found on the website for the program series, which is secleanenergy.gotech.edu. This is a new address, and I would encourage you to mark it, uh, to bookmark it on your browser. And that contains the webcast of all the presentations to date as well as slides from all the spe previous speakers. And that's where today's presentation, next week, will, that will, those links will be live for today's presentation. Um, today, we'll, after our uh, presentations by our two distinguished speakers, we'll have uh, time for questions, and microphones will be passed around among the, the audience. I would encourage you to speak in the microphone since this is being webcast. And for those of you participating over the web, I would ask that you uh, email me your, with your questions, and my email address is ben.hill at g-a-t-e-c-h dot e-d-u. Look forward to uh, having a great conversation. So again, remember to uh, mark your calendars for November 16th for the next program, and announcements will be uh, sent out in, next week. And I'd like to introduce Tom Warren, Chair of Sutherland's Energy Project Team and Sustainability Program, who will introduce our speakers. Uh, 12.30. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we, we've moved the program from 12 to 12.30, which allows folks to grab lunch, uh, an early lunch, 
and then we'll uh, we may, uh, the program runs from 12:30 to two. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, Sutherland. We're proud sponsors of the Clean Energy Speaker Series. It have been since its inception. Um, Sutherland is a, uh, a comprehensive law firm. We have over 50 lawyers in our energy group uh, serving all areas uh, of, of the energy industry. Uh, we've certainly had our renewable energy group has been most prominently involved with the Clean Energy Speaker Series, um, but we also have uh, a full service uh, natural gas practice uh, covering regulatory compliance, commercial uh, matters for all, uh, all players in the, in the industry. And certainly been uh, following and assisting clients regularly with, uh, with all the legal developments relating to, uh, to, to shale gas and its implications, uh, not only in the gas industry, but the LNG industry and power industry as well. So we're very uh, proud to uh, introduce uh, today two uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, the first is uh, Mr. Carlos uh, Santamarina, uh, who is professor and Goizeta Foundation Chair at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, Mr. Santamarina leads a research team that explores the scientific foundations of soil behavior and subsurface processes. Uh, his research uh, is helping to address issues in geotechnical engineering uh, to improve uh, efficiency, conservation, resource recovery, energy storage, and waste utilization uh, in the energy industry. Uh, following that, we will uh, hear from Mr. Uh, Seta, uh, Seta Gupta, uh, who is the Senior Research Director of Fracturing Technology at Baker Hughes. Uh, Mr. Gupta's career has been in the oil and gas industry. After working uh, on the research staffs of Gulf and Pennzoil. He joined the Western Company, uh, which through acquisitions is now part of Baker Hughes. Um, he was the chief chemical engineer at Western, uh, is the inventor or co-inventor of over a hundred U.S. and international patents uh, related to uh, fracturing fluids and additives. Uh, and he continues to have a leadership role at his current company uh, in systems that enable operators to frack oil and gas wells in a responsible and safe manner while maximizing production. Uh, so it should be a, a great uh, series today. And uh, without further ado, I introduce Mr. Santorini. Thank you for the introductions and for the opportunity to be here today with all of you. Um, this is uh, the title of today's presentation. And before we go any further, let me make a brief disclosure here. Um, uh, I, uh, I come to this area from a tangential point of view, from the point of view of uh, uh, geomaterials and the energy sector, not with an expertise per se in shale gas. And the second one, which, by the way, I hope it brings some, some fresh views into it, and the second observation I would like to make is that, yes, we have been indeed supported by all the major uh, energy resource companies. However, we have not had funds uh, to support our research in the, in the area of shale gas. With that being said, uh, there are three topics that I would like to cover today. The first one is, what are shales? I thought that this was probably a fairly uh, varied audience and uh, that will be interesting to, to review. Um, and how come the gas is there. And this will be a little more on the technical end, but hopefully the, the purpose is to build up with building blocks the foundations for all the concepts that we need to understand the complexity of the problem. The second part is to address the issue of hydraulic fracture, which is the uh, critical technique that is used to recover the gas from shale gas. And finally, to put some thoughts together related to the global perspective and context for the problems that we are going to address. So this is what uh, uh, shale is uh, basically describe us. And so let's try to understand some of these uh, uh, descriptors. Um, it is a fairly old rock. And if you look at the history of the Earth, which is about four and a half billion years old, 
And not much happened for the first billion years. Then finally, we have the bacteria and the plants, and organic matter began accumulating. That is the time. Let me put the mouse in permanent mode. Bear with me for a second. And this is the time where uh, the dinosaurs and the more organic matter began accumulating. So this uh, has taken several million years uh, for this to develop. These rocks are rich in organic content. Uh, this is a, a scanning electron microscopy where you see the organic matter surrounded by the mineral matrix around it. I will come back to say more about both of them. Typically, we are looking for rocks that will have between 1% and 20% organic matter. These are described as source rocks. In this picture, you can see this is the same as a, 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 a ultrasound in medical diagnosis. What you see here are uh, the images of the subsurface. These are hundreds of meters below the seafloor. And this is a source rock, which in this case is producing the uh, uh, hydrocarbons that are migrating and you can even see the gas leaking through. In this case, the shale itself is not only the reservoir, it's also the source rock where the gas is actually being produced and stored. In order for this gas to form, the material must have been ex exposed to fairly high temperatures. Uh, typically above 160 degrees Celsius. And if we take a typical geothermal gradient, you have to conclude that these rocks at some point were buried at about 5,000 meters of depth. Shallower materials, if they have never been exposed to deeper uh, positions with higher temperatures, they may still have methane. It will be mostly biogenic in origin. And bacteria tend to be quite selective, so it's, it would be primarily the methane that will be present, and that is called dry gas in the industry. Otherwise, the wet gas is obtained by basically cooking all this organic matter and breaking it down, and you will find the methane, ethane, butane, propane, etc. And this would be more mature reservoirs. However, if we go and look at the depth that we are going to, where we find them nowadays and we are producing them from, they are much shallower. That means that these rocks were buried and somehow they came up to the surface. The upper crust had been eroded. And these very high stresses that they experience, vertically is gone, horizontally is locked in. And so they tend to be fairly high horizontal stresses, which may help as well as hurt us in the production process. Typically, compared to other shales, this will have a fairly high porosity. So 2 to 15% of the volume is void. However, something weird happens, and let's try to explain that one. Uh, these, material, these shales have several minerals, particularly clay minerals. And these are pictures of clay minerals. Notice the scale. These are 10 microns, 20, 10 microns. And you can see the flakes are indeed very thin. If you measure the amount of surface you have per gram, for example, an esmectite could have anywhere between 300 and 700 meters square per gram. A gram of, of, of dirt, a gram of clay, is a very small quantity. And however, if you could spread it, it would cover 700 square meters. And so the consequence of that is that even though the porosity may be relatively high, the pore size is minute. Look, in a kaolin with 20% porosity, so this is on the higher end of our, our, our shales, the pores will be 10 nanometers. In an, in an esmectite, it would be three angstroms. So these are very small pores, and that leads to uh, several consequences. The first one will be that bacteria are about one micron in size. So they don't fit, it doesn't, bacteria don't fit in the, in, the, in the pores. So either they were there and they got trapped and they are quite immobile and they are not doing much for you, they are inside small closets, um, or they have been squeezed and basically uh, mechanically sterilized. So the question whether we find bacteria or not in these shales is a matter of probabilities. What is the probability of finding pores larger than the size of a bacteria? 
And it turns out to be, for example, in one of these, it would be like having one person in all Manhattan. Imagine the number of apartments in Manhattan, etc., and having only one person. That would be more or less the probability of finding the bacteria in, 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 in shales for that pore size, unless there are cracks and few other conditions that may lead to the presence of bacteria, which, by the way, can be quite nasty at the time of production. If the pores are so small, the permeability is also very small. Consequence of this is that these materials, the matrix of these materials, is very tight and it's very difficult to remove fluids or gases out of it. However, there are plenty of natural fractures. This is, an, this is exaggerated, uh, but uh, I want to make the point. This is a shale core after it has been excavated. There is very pronounced expansion, and because of that expansion, it delaminates in multiple layers, but this will still be present in a closed form in the shale in situ. And this begins to give, you, to give you an idea as to how can we get the gas out. Basically, we want to open up all those uh, microfractures. Where is the gas? Well, the gas is partially free in those cracks. It's absorbed on the kerogen and the mineral surface, and it may be trapped in the pores. So if you just take a piece of these shales and you expose it and you measure the amount of gas that comes out versus time, the first, the free one comes out very fast. The adsorb would come out gradually, and then you will have to crush it to liberate the gas that is trapped in the small pores. Of course, this is very relevant for production purposes. When these shales get buried, this is like mud in, 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 in a pond, uh, which is lacking oxygen because of the excess of organic matter, and then gradually gets buried uh, to greater and greater depths. When these shales get buried, uh, water was present, and that water may still be present. And what you see there are two grains with water in between. And see what happens when the water evaporates. And this little meniscus here is what causes our clothes to shrink when we dry them, by the way is producing huge forces in the context of shales. And we can compute those forces, and we can also predict how much pressure it takes to push the gas out. And this pressure is huge. In an elite, would be 130 megapascals, which would be equivalent to uh, uh, 13,000 meters below the sea level. Great depth. That is the pressure they can sustain before you can actually get it out. So a couple more concepts. Um, because of how it is trapped, the recovery efficiency tends to be quite low. And if you have low recovery efficiency because of economy of scales, you actually need to uh, try to reach very large drainage volumes in order to recover the gas. And so that will be part of the purpose of how we extract it. Finally, do remember that uh, these are quite brittle, as you can see in this excavation. Of course, under high stresses, the brittleness uh, tends to, to, to vanish. And we go back to these wonderful marine seismic records. There are two here, one at the top and the other one at the bottom, from my colleague Joe Carwright in, in, Card in, in, in Cardiff. And when we look at nature with great detail that now marine seismic allow us to do, we see that there are lots of very unique features that we don't anticipate in nice layered depositions. We see that there are these pipes, very difficult to explain. We don't have a good physical explanation for those. We see all these fractures, quite major fractures. And so we have to conclude that the geoplumbing of the subsurface is very complex. And we tend to trivialize it, and that may lead to some uh, consequences and uncertainties that we ought to be aware of. So where is the shale gas? Uh, here is, there are, uh, few maps, uh, sorry, but this projection is cut in the right-hand side of the, of the images. But um, uh, here is where all major oil reserves are. This is where coal is, and this is shale gas. And on this one, we are doing quite well because we have plenty of it. And so are some European countries. The problem is whether they will allow for the drilling and uh, I'm coming from Argentina, and they must be very happy with this result. 
particularly in the U.S., um, um, these uh, uh, reservoirs are quite well uh, known and, and uh, extensively being uh, investigated and, in fact, uh, produced nowadays. That was the first part. I thought that uh, I wanted to provide some physical insight as to what this material is and the difficulties in extracting this gas. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Gupta was telling me that uh, five, ten years ago, uh, anybody would say that uh, we would be producing so much gas today and planning so much for the future, uh, you would be thought of uh, losing your, 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 your reason. Eh? Uh, but this is indeed, uh, I'm not, I don't want to misquote you, so please say that one correctly when you come up. Uh, uh, but um, indeed, uh, there has been a dramatic change in the, in the playing field. So how are we going to recover this gas that is trapped in these rocks with such a small porosity? Well, the key here is hydraulic fracture. There are two steps to get there. Once again, remember, the goal is to have a large drainage volume. Otherwise, this is economically not feasible. So the first step is to drill. And let me put this in perspective with respect to the medical field. This is laparoscopy. And if you see how far you go in and what is the diameter of the tool, you are somewhere in the 10 to 1 ratio. This is a catheter and probably is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 ratio. By the way, this one goes through an artery. Eh? It's not that it can, it can deviate too much. It's quite constrained. Hmm? Uh, I hate to say, but, but, but uh, colonoscopy is somewhere here. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, now let's, put, let's compare now with uh, geo uh, the, 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 the same technique, directional drilling in the petroleum industry, and we had a wonderful example during the Macondo well. This is 15,000 feet. Sorry for the scale, but otherwise things don't fit in the, in the, in the thing. We were 15,000 feet. 5,000 feet of water, 10,000 feet underneath the sediment. And we had to go and intercept that well. And all of a sudden, you're looking with something that is the diameter of a string for another object which is about the diameter of a string in a room which is larger than this room. And it's not guided through an artery. You have to guide it and move along and go through transverse anisotropies, et cetera, et cetera, and multi-layers and find that well. I have to, I really have to believe that. You have to, you have to contrast this with what we admire so much today of the medical revolution, and we have to realize that this is a very smart industry uh, with very smart people doing very challenging work. The step two is that once we have reached the location, we have to fracture it to be able to reach the smaller pores and these are some sketches that you find when you Google hydraulic fracture and you go for images. Um, I decided to purposely remove the name of the authors, but this, trust me, this comes from a very well-known re referee journal publication. Um, this comes from people who don't like uh, hydraulic fracture in shales very much, and you see the fractures going all the way to the, to the water table. Um, then we have fractures that look like this. And we have these like trees. Uh, to be honest, we don't know really how, how they look. Uh, we are trying to begin to gain an understanding of that. Let me tell you some of the theories behind. For many years, this has been the driving uh, uh, hypothesis. And this applies to a homogeneous material. Imagine that you take a ball of jello and you begin injecting with a syringe. You begin injecting into it some viscous fluid. You're going to get a fairly clean fracture looking quasi-ellipsoidal, and it's going to be a single fracture. If the medium is completely fractured, this is a soil, and now we begin pressurizing from the top, you're looking through a high-pressure uh, vessel here, uh, and we put two indentations just to trigger it, you see the fractures that they begin to form, fairly clean fractures. Those two at the center will merge, and then... But what happens when you have a fully fractured medium, and uh, these are wonderful uh, experiments by, by, by Sherry Roshanka? Roshanka? I have to practice your last name, Sherry, I apologize. Um, and so this is a shale. Eh? It's fully fractured, and now we are going to inject something here fairly, relatively high viscosity in this case, otherwise it would leak off very fast in this experiment. And let's see what happens. 
it begins to expand, but let's see what happens in all these other fractures. So even though the fracture is forming here, we are opening all the other internal structure of the material. I believe that this is at the heart of why these methods turn out to be so efficient in shales. I'll give you another example. Once again from Sherry, we are lifting at the point at the bottom. These are like legal blo blocks. And you see how we are opening up all the structure because of the latency. This is the essential component. So we have to kind of walk away from our standard theories, which were so robust for 150 years, and begin understanding these with new conceptions. This is the way it looks. Now you can, I actually went into Google uh, and, <coughs> and uh, Google Earth, and uh, this is in Wyoming. You see all the pads. These are all the drilling pads, and there will be multiple wells going out from each of them. How does it look in West Virginia? Don't be confused. Many of these are farms, but some of the other dots are all gas wells. This is in Texas, East Texas close to the border. So uh, we are really, we, we are seeing it with Google Earth. We are, we are really uh, making uh, indents into the topography. What is the idea here? The idea is, and then these are the great developments that are making this economically feasible. First of all is directional drilling, this wonderful technology that I described before in comparison to med medicine. And so the idea is to put end wells per pad. This is a pad looking at it from the top. And if you, if you are able to do that and drill for long distances from each pad, then you're going to have few pads that will affect the surface, that will impact the surface. And there will be a line in the direction where you're going to intersect the most fractures. And so we're going to begin seeing geometries like that in the subsurface. By the way, I don't know if this drawing is clear. I'm starting from this point and crossing underneath towards the, the west, and starting from this point and crossing the east towards, towards the, the, the east, so I can also produce underneath the pad. Fractur fracturing or fracking or hydraulic fracturing is done as follows. They put a plug and they go with, with a gun, they shoot holes, and they trigger the formation of hydraulic fracture here. They remove this plug, they go to the next sector, to the next sector. This multi-stage fracking, which is probably in the last 10 years, has made this incredibly financially feasible. Uh, like any process, we ought to be thinking of quality control, quality assurance, and there are wonderful techniques for monitoring. First of all, every time we fracture, the ground is screaming, literally screaming, and those are called microseismicity, and we can hear it, and the same way that we can detect the epicentral location of an earthquake, we can determine where is the screaming coming from, and you put dots that illuminate the area, that is being altered by the, this injection. What are we injecting? Well, uh, it all depends who puts the numbers. The numbers are all the same, but it all depends how you color the numbers. They are more or less scary. Uh, we're injecting 90% water and about 9% solids, because once you make the fracture, you want to leave a porous medium inside that will keep the fracture open. That is called the propan. Even though in shales, because of all their structure, just by the fact that you shear them, it will lock in some of that dilation. But you still want to put some of the propan inside, and propan is sand or, or glass beads. It takes about two to four million gallons of water per well, multiply that times several pa uh, wells per pad, and you are injecting quite a lot of volume. Um, I do some com computations and for the largest size Olympic pools, the one that is full, full length, and two meters deep, that is about one million gallons. So um, that gives you the idea that uh, you will use like two or four large size swimming pools of water for each well, and you have several wells per pad. So uh, water demands are significant. Uh, Propan, no problems. Now, lots of additives are used. And by the way, Dr. Gupta comes with a degree in chemistry, so he will be able to tell you much more about these components. They, in fact, have patented and developed many of them. But um, you need surfactants. You need potassium chloride uh, for some of the clays, because that will mm, elitize some of the clays and prevent their dispersion. You want some de uh, gelling agents, because if the water is not viscous enough, it cannot carry the propane. 
the, the, the propant is heavier than, 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 than the fluid. So you need this gelling agent to increase the viscosity. Then you want to break that one. Because if that gel remains inside, you cannot get the gas out. So you want to break it. Um, you are pumping for very long distances. You would like to reduce the friction. And that is what is called a slick water. Remember the bacteria. They may be locked, but now you are going to release them. And they are going to love some of these chemicals. And they are going to begin bioclogging. And so you want to get rid of that. Um, as soon as you make the perforations, if, if some of the minerals are, are carbon carbonates. And so you would like to clean those holes so you can have a better injection. So you're going to acidify it, but then you have to adjust the pH. And um, you don't want in the process to corrode the pipe. So it lasts for a long time. So, you're, so this is a small percentage, less than 0.5%. Now, if you start with a million gallons, uh, uh, that is 5,000 gallons per well, uh, and there are several wells per pad, and that creates lo lots of anxiety. And so, what comes back? Well, 10 to 60 percent of the injected fluids are coming back, and these numbers vary in a wide range. I don't know if we understand why. Uh, I'm not sure that the industry must know uh, under what conditions you recover more. The cuttings come back, and that's the reason why you use the drilling mat to partially float the, the cuttings back to the surface. And wherever there, we have lots of organic materials, there is this derivative of uranium that is also creating quite a lot of concern. And where does all that water go? And where is the state where you're drilling? And where is the state where the, that you're disposing of this? Like Pennsylvania and New York. And that came out and was, was brought to, to, to great news through Scientific American. So there are, I think, great opportunities for how do we handle the water and the returns and how much we can recycle and how do we dispose. The second thing is, uh, you may have seen the movie Gasland and you see lots of gas bubbling, uh, sometimes through the, through, through the water faucet, sometimes in the river and streams. Uh, so we may break some of the seals and this CH4 may come to the surface. And there has been quite a lot of controversy in the last few months between some reports uh, here in the US. But it appears that somewhere between 1% and 8% of all the gas that will be produced actually is fugitive, leaks out. And now that is a problem because uh, uh, methane is 72 times as stronger as greenhouse gas than CO2. And so let's go back to history and let's see this is methane, this is CO2. And we see the oscillations of CO2 during, during the, the, the glaciation period and the hockey stick in the last thousand years. Here is the Industrial Revolution kicking that one up. And what has happened in the last 50 years or 60 years? Let's look for the same period what happened with the methane. We have the oscillations. And this is also kicking up. And the question is, what will happen when we begin producing all this shale gas? Lots of controversy taking place. So to close, some perspective and a few other closing thoughts and context. Uh, remember, I showed you the first part. That is where the, all these uh, fossil fuels got created. And there was a red line. Now I'm going to expand. This is that red line. This is the time in history for fossil fuels. Starting with the Industrial Revolution, and with or without shale gas, we're going to finish it within the next 200 years, let's say. Okay? So in the history of the Earth, this is a spike. In our history, and our children, uh, this spike, uh, the presence of shale gas, will help in this transition towards uh, lower greenhouse gas fuels. And that's the hope. That's the selling point. If we look at uh, the whole energy use in the US, uh, natural gas is meant to, to increase now with shale gas. This is 2008, so you should expect significant changes. Um, in certain parts of the world, nuclear is going down. Consider Germany, Switzerland, Japan. Japan has no promise to close, but uh, has low, uh, cut down the, 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 the use of, of nuclear by 50% or so. And um, so if we begin to have more and more available and cheaper natural gas, we can begin uh, finding new applications into the whole energy spectrum of, of, of usage probably particularly in the transportation sector. Before I leave this slide, I have to highlight that 
wasted energy is more than the used energy. So uh, always whenever we look at the whole energy balance menu, we ought to think what can we do to reduce this component? Eh? This is what uh, our, our uh, the director of DOE, Dr. Chu, would say, the low hanging fruits in the energy sector. Eh? There ought to be a great role for all of us to play in that. But let me continue with the shale gas. The importance then of having the shale gas is that if we look at what has happened with petroleum is what we import the most. And that will hopefully, I believe we will decline, which changes a whole role that, that, that we, and the way we interact with the rest of the world and our own internal financial balance, quite importantly. Finally, uh, we are still burning a fossil fuel, probably a little more effective, but the transition, there is lots of embodied energy and CO2 in the current infrastructure, so it's not that we can just go ahead and change it. Uh, second, we have to be careful with the CH4 leakage. So in conclusion, I think that uh, the industry has been promoting shale gas quite, uh, quite uh, actively. And uh, we have been uh, welcome customers. We would love to have this uh, energy, and, and politicians, of course, are very supportive of the idea. Um, I have the feeling, and once again, I come from a tangential perspective here, I have the feeling that uh, uh, there are questions that do remain, uh, valid questions that do remain with respect to the environmentally safe execution. I tried to show you some evidence of that. Uh, this is not only the, in the case in the US, but in the European countries I mentioned earlier as well. Uh, the media has kept a uh, watchful eye, and I think that that is something that we ought to welcome. Um, there is also inquisitive academia, and I think that these two contribute to a very healthy atmosphere, which, by the way, I'm sure that ultimately the industry itself uh, um, would welcome and, 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 and accept and stimulate all these great individuals and IQ in the industry to do even better. In closing, I leave you with this image. Keep an eye on the fractures. <laughs> Thank you. It's difficult to follow Carlos, but I'll try. Uh, what I thought I would do is uh, talk more about fracturing. Uh, again, we want to be smart about uh, producing the natural gas, but also we want to be smart about the environment. So I'll talk a little bit about hydraulic fracturing. Uh, if uh, you don't know, uh, Baker Hughes is one of the uh, three largest uh, oil field service companies and uh, I was with BJ Services which is part of Baker Hughes now, a pressure pumping group and uh, uh, so we've been involved in hydraulic fracturing for a long time. Uh, I'll touch on hydraulic fracturing, the history and why, why it is important for shale gas. Also I'll talk about uh, answering some of the issues that Carlos brought up in terms of environmental stewardship, what we are doing, uh, not only Baker Hughes, but the whole industry is. So uh, I think uh, Carlos has already touched on some of it. Uh, why do we hydraulically fracture? Uh, we hydraulically fracture two types of reservoirs. The low permeability reservoir which essentially does not have uh, the, the, the porosity or the permeability of the rock is so low that the oil or gas will not flow freely. So to make the well commercially uh, feasible, you need to fracture. Uh, so that will improve and accelerate uh, the recovery rate of the well. And also we can access uh, more of the reserve, reserves doing hydraulic fractures. Uh, and then in high permeability reservoirs, moderate to high permeability, uh, when we drill the well, we damage the uh, permeability of the uh, well. So we frack it to bypass the damage that we are uh, creating when we drill the well. Uh, this is 
You know, a lot of people think uh, hydraulic fracturing, uh, we've been doing it only in the last uh, five to ten years. Uh, that's not true. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time. So the process itself is essentially we pump the fracturing fluid and prop it into the producing formation under very high pressure and rate. Uh, again, when the fluid pressure on the bottom of the build, uh, bottom of the well is high enough, you essentially uh, literally fracture the formation or you form a crack. Uh, but then if you release the pressure, it will close on you. So you need to keep it open and that's where the propens come in. So, uh, and the uh, propens are typically, depending upon the closure pressure or how much uh, 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 pressure is exerted on the propent can be as simple as sand and when you say, when you say sand it is not any sand uh, it is a special type of sand and we are the only industry which exports uh, fracturing sand to Saudi Arabia for example uh, it has to be defect free sand otherwise it will crush and create fines uh, for higher closures we use uh, we might use ceramic or higher strength propens all the way to uh, bauxite. So once you create it, essentially we are building a highway for the oil or gas to flow back uh, to the surface so we can produce. So that's, that's in short what hydraulic fracturing is. It is a proven uh, technology. The first commercial fracturing treatment was performed 60 years ago. So it's not new. Uh, we've been doing it in the industry for a long time. Uh, if you count the number, of, I mean the whole industry, we have done over two million uh, uh, wells were fragged just in the United States. Uh, as uh, an industry, we fracture tens of thousands of wells each year. And then so far, there has been no documented record of harm to groundwater from fracturing. So there are several benefits uh, because of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, the fracturing has been responsible for the addition of more than 7 billion barrels of oil and uh, 600 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in the United States. So you could not produce this oil and gas from tight formations, unconventional reservoirs without using hydraulic fracture technology. So again, as Carlos has mentioned, uh, with uh, able to produce this natural gas economically in the US, uh, you can reduce our dependence on uh, foreign oil or natural gas for that uh, matter. And then uh, on a personal side, I've been employed by this industry and so are millions of Americans either directly or indirectly uh, because of uh, hydraulic fracturing. So why is it big in the US? The reason is so far 65 to 70 percent of global fracturing occurs in the US. And if you take North America, that number goes to almost 90 percent. And Today, 70 to 80 percent of the wells which are drilled in the U.S. are either tight gas, tight gas sands, or what we call unconventional gas, which is shale or coal bed methane wells. And almost all the tight gas and unconventional gas wells, you have to hydraulically fracture to make it economically productive. Uh, this gives, uh, this is from uh, Department of Energy. Uh, this gives uh, the, the natural gas production in the US. And as you see, from about 2005 is when shale gas uh, uh, started coming into the picture. And then if you look at the projection to 2035, uh, quite a bit of uh, the natural gas production in the US is projected to be from uh, shale gas, tight gas, and coal bed methane. So the conventional easy gas is not there. Uh, 
So it's all unconventional gas is the future. Uh, again, conventional gas, I'm sure you guys have seen uh, where it is produced. It's, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the conventional uh, fields in the U.S., all the way from Colorado, Texas to Gulf of Mexico, and, and also in the Northeast. This is what the conventional gas has been. And then uh, about, I would say, 20 years ago, we started uh, looking at coal bed methane originally as a means of uh, removing the uh, uh, methane before uh, they could mine for coal and then we saw there was an energy there and uh, in this part of the country in the Black Warrior Basin uh, there's been a lot of CBM wells drilled and fracked and uh, produced so th th this was the first in a way unconventional gas uh, uh, produced in the US and then we started looking, uh, uh, there was some uh, uh, federal tax incentives which uh, uh, made us look at uh, tight gas plays. And uh, these were the, some of the tight gas play, plays in the US, which made again fracturing very, uh, made uh, because of fracturing, some of the production from this became very economically feasible. And these are the shale plays which in the last, uh, as you see, uh, last six years, the, the shale place has increased the seven times our uh, drilling that we are doing in the US. And then uh, today, more than 50% of the US expenditures on completing the wells are on shale. So that's why shale fracturing is becoming very popular. And that's why there's been a lot of uh, discussion about it in the media. Uh, and then you can also see there is a lot of shale to be, uh, 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 which we have identified, which we are not producing from yet. Because of the uh, uh, natural gas prices being down, uh, right now majority of activity has been in, even though I'm talking about shale gas today, has been in what we call liquids from shale, which is uh, pretty light oil, which is in the Balkan in North Dakota, uh, uh, and then uh, in Eagleford Shale in South Texas, which are very, very active now, because even oil prices are uh, much higher uh, relatively compared to natural gas prices today. So uh, these are some of the basins. Uh, you know, the, the shale gas boom, in a way, started in Bonnet Shale in Texas, Louisiana. And uh, this chart gives uh, the typical depth of the formations, the thickness of the shale fields, uh, the, and once you frag the wells, the typical initial production rates in uh, millions of uh, CFD. Uh, and then, as uh, Carlos mentioned, in all these wells, we are doing horizontal uh, uh, drilling. And so the typical average lateral uh, that is the uh, length of the horizontal section in these fields, as you see in Haynesville and Eagleford Shale, some of the horizontal sections are uh, five to 6,000 feet in length. And then once you uh, drill that long horizontals, you have to do uh, fracturing, multi-stage fracturing. Nowadays, we are doing, we are dividing that 5,000 feet section into anywhere from 30 to 40 to 45 stages and we frack each one. And because of uh, uh, fracturing, uh, the, the reserves in each one of the shale fields uh, is given in trillions of uh, cubic feet. And then there was a question somebody asked me, what does a typical well cost to drill and complete in each one of these? This is a, a typical average uh, well cost. This is to drill a well, one well, not a pad, and then fracture the well, complete the well. So you're talking about anywhere from two to six million, to, uh, seven, eight million dollars per well in these basins. Uh, and then the, because of uh, horizontal drilling and fracturing, the, uh, the ultimate recovery in billions of cubic feet in each one of these uh, shale plays 
of government here. So we have a, a good resource uh, with natural, I mean, with uh, shale gas in the U.S., which will take us for the next 20 to 30 years without having to depend on uh, imported oil. Uh, I thought I'll show, uh, you know, uh, Paul has already mentioned, these shales are like tombstone. You cannot get gas out of it. Lucky for us, they all have natural fractures. You see the various uh, outcrops from the various shales which, which show uh, the natural fractures. And all we are trying to do with uh, hydraulic fracturing is to interconnect these uh, natural fractures so gas can flow uh, to the well bore and to the surface. And they're very highly fractured and laminated. And uh, since he already mentioned it, I'm not going to, uh, uh, again, the whole idea is we are drilling the uh, horizontal well, and how we drill it, which direction we drill it, will depend on, because of the stress, horizontal and vertical stresses, it's very important we, we understand the formation, and then depending upon how we drill it, we can get uh, various types of fractures when we frag the well. So uh, there's a lot of physics involved in it. And then, you know, we are just not doing simple fracturing. We are doing what we call simultaneous fracturing. Essentially here from one single pad, I'm showing two wells which were drilled side by side and you frack both the wells simultaneously. So when you do that, there is stress interference between the wells so you get better coverage. And essentially what we want to do is interconnect all the natural fractures. Okay, so this is how an operation looks like. There is a lot of uh, equipment on location when you do one of these fracks and it is, the equipment is pretty expensive. So in this particular uh, job, we had 25 frack pumps, which created 50,000 hydraulic horsepower. That is the amount of power you're using to break open the earth, essentially. And in this well, in these two wells, I guess, we used over 2 million pounds of propane. So just uh, as I mentioned, we are one of the three largest uh, 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 pressure pumping companies. Just last year, uh, at Baker Hughes, we have about 500 frack pumps. We have a capacity for 1.3 million hydraulic horsepower, 60 blenders, and we did about 15,000 plus frag jobs just in the US. So the total market just in the US is about 10 million hydraulic horsepower. There are a lot of competitors, a lot of mom and pops, in addition to the big three, which has created some of the environmental issues. Uh, and you know, last year we did over 80,000 frag jobs as an industry just in the US. Canada is another big area for tight gas and shales. And again, we have about 170,000 hydraulic horsepower and uh, quite a bit operation in Canada. So the total global market for uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing is about 13 million hydraulic horsepower. And then as an industry, we create a revenue of about $15 billion. This is a big industry. Just to give you a flavor, this is some of our uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing equipment. Uh, you know, each, each one of these can create between two to 3,000 hydraulic horsepower. And then essentially what we are doing is we are setting up a chemical plant on location, do the job, disassemble it, go to the next location and do the same thing over and over. So we have chemical additive units, the propant comes in, uh, in a big container that we can meter, and then all the chemicals are added on location using a blending unit, and it's all monitored using, it's just like a chemical uh, uh, chemical plant you have seen. So it's very similar to that, except it is all mobile. And then we do quality control. And then the customers nowadays even doesn't have to go to location. We can monitor everything, and then send all the data to our office or their office, uh, 
So again, the fracturing itself can be done in multiple ways. Uh, it, we can do it down casing, down tubing, down annulus. So there's a lot of technology involved. And there are all kinds of, you know, I mentioned uh, horizontal wells with uh, multi-zone multi, multi -zone, uh, fracturing. There are all kinds, you can separate it with ball sealers. Uh, there's all kinds of ways you can do it. Uh, you can isolate the various stages with sand plugs, balls, bridge plugs, and packers. So there's a lot of equipment and a lot of technology which goes into it. So I want to switch a little bit, and I think uh, Carlos already mentioned. Uh, so over 99% of what we pump in shale fracturing is water and sand, and about 0.4% is additives. And uh, on the right side, it lists some of the additives we use, and I think Carlos already mentioned some of it, so I'm not going to go except to say, if you look at the volume-wise, the amount of chemicals percentage-wise we are putting is very, very little. But the volumes can still be uh, large. And if you look at the whole thing, uh, the, the two things which, which, which could be considered non-green is biocide, because its purpose is to kill bacteria, and then acid potentially, and then corrosion inhibitor. So we've been... Again, a lot of these chemicals in everyday use, the common person comes into contact with, for example, hydrochloric acid. If you have a swimming pool, you're using it to adjust your pH. Biocides, it's used to sterilize medical and dental equipment. So a lot of the additives, people are, I mean, the, the, the gel we use is guar. So if you had soup today, ice cream today, most probably you ate guar. So it's a it's, lot of the chemicals are what a person will come in contact with every day. Uh, it, it's, but when you give the chemical name or an MSDS uh, or CAS number, people think it's a chemical. I mean, without chemicals, we can't live anyway. So what are we doing as an industry and what we are doing? We have moved from, we have also, when the, when the, when, when, somebody challenges it, we also become smarter. So as an industry, we have gone to uh, environmentally compliant frac fluids. So again, it is very important both from, uh, for, for us as well as as industry. So in 2008, we switched completely to non-diesel uh, uh, containing uh, fluids. So we have removed all BTEX from all our chemicals, which is benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, and xylene voluntarily. Uh, so now all the products that we, as a company, that we use uh, in, in uh, shale fracturing either meet or exceed uh, all the uh, regulations and guidelines. Uh, and we are, we also want to protect our own people, not only the, the, the uh, we want to be good corporate citizens as well as so we are moving to more green, quote-unquote, products, if some, anybody can define what green is. So we've been working with the Groundwater Protection Council and the uh, Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. And so we are working with an outside uh, uh, consulting company, and we provide uh, all uh, chemical information on all our chemicals through our website. So if you search by the well API number, state or county information, and if we have fracked the well, all the chemicals we use, including volumes and everything, is listed there. So we have become very open. And then, as Carlos mentioned, there's been some concern about uh, uh, hydraulic fractures uh, contaminating groundwater. There are a couple of uh, this is uh, from an SPE paper to be presented uh, uh, next month, I believe, by Pinnacle. And what, what it shows is on the top uh, is the water table, and at the bottom is the micro seismic from fracturing treatments. And as you can see, at least in the Marcellus, where they have done this mapping, uh, where, where the micro seismics are created by hydraulic fracturing is several thousand feet below 
water table. Now, does it mean there is no gas escaping to the surface? This is, if you don't do a good cement job, you could also, you can always have leaks because of that. But if you have good integrity of your cement, and if you do hydraulic fracturing, it shows that it should not contaminate water table. This is the same thing in Barnard Shale, where we have done over, I believe, 5,000 uh, uh, wells were fracked in the last five years. Again, it shows the same thing. Uh, the the uh, micro seismic done on the right, it, it shows the various uh, counties in Texas where uh, the fracks have been done. Uh, it is much, much below the water table. So if you do everything right, you should not contaminate the water table from hydraulic action. So the other thing we have done as uh, Baker Hughes is we have gone to what we call smart care system because we couldn't find a definition for green. So we decided to uh, uh, come up with our own definition. So essentially we have all our systems, we come up with technology. We still want to deliver superior well performance and value. It has to do fit for purpose. If it is going to be a frac fluid, it should work as a frac fluid. But again, we are using compatible quality and short chemical additives that are not only physically safe, but also environmentally responsible. So we have rated all our products in various areas and uh, over 140 plus products that we use. And again, we are doing full disclosure using uh, a, an outside consulting company. And, and we look at all our products for uh, all these categories and we score them uh, uh, and then we are using products uh, and, and this is becoming very important not only in the US and Canada but internationally Australia we're doing a lot of shale fracks and Europe there are a couple of bands but the whole industry is moving international and the regulations are different in different countries so we are essentially creating a classification process which takes into all these areas, and we are addressing products which have the least effect in all these areas. And our competitors are doing something similar, if not exactly the same thing. So again, this gives you the scores, and then we score, and then we compare our products and use the least, uh, most effective in terms of performance and least damaging uh, to the environment human health and physical habits. So that's, that's where we are going in terms of stewardship. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, 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 where we did two wells similar. Recently, we did three wells together. This is the equipment on location where we used 55,000 uh, hydraulic horsepower, and this was a small job. The, the wells had only four and four and five stages. We used a total of 14 million gallons of water and five and a half million pounds of propane on this job. So that's all I wanted to say, and I think both of us will be happy to answer any questions. questions in the audience let me if I could um, to start off with a question from the uh, from a participant over the uh, webcast um, this question is uh, in reference to seismic concerns in the fracking process so in particular recent concerns have been raised not about fracturing creating seismic disturbances but rather about the Reinjection of the disposal fluids creating seismic disturbances. Uh, do the panelists have 
thoughts and ideas about the seismic issues that are being raised? Uh, I'm not aware of injections creating. When we say, I think when Carlos and I mentioned, well, Carlos mentioned micro seismic, we are talking about small uh, seismic events, not earthquake type events. I'll let Carlos answer. The, the ground is stressed. So um, if you, and, and there are already, like I showed you in some of the marine seismic, uh, it's typically faulted at some scale. So if you happen to inject, uh, um, to, in, to, to inject the fluid and pressurize it, um, you may force some of those fractures to, to open and reactivate uh, uh, existing faults. So some of that may happen. Uh, I think that the tremors that have been detected are relatively minor, but that is uh, a common observation from uh, geothermal to creating a swan dam. Um, every time we do something to alter the state of stress in the ground, it will react. Yeah? And if it was already at the verge of failing, uh, then we are given that additional kick, and, and so there are some possibilities, and we ought to be alert. But so far, I believe that all the cases are very minor. Okay, um, it's on? Yeah. I just came back from spending the summer in my hometown of Slaterville, New York. And of course, hydrofracking was of considerable concern. And I thought I would like to bring a third perspective here. These were the kinds of issues that came up in the meetings. And I'm an environmental sociologist, so I go to these meetings. One concern, of course, was about the normal accident. The feeling that, well, everything should go right, but it never does. This in the wake of the Gulf oil spill, of course. Second, where will the water come from that's used in fracking? Where will it go? A third concern that was not raised here was about changes in land cover the loss of forest and agricultural land to the pads, and the increase in the amount of particulate matter in the atmosphere as a result. A third environmental issue of concern to local authorities particularly is the stress on roads. Infrastructure is a big budget issue for small town and county governments who's going to pay for road deterioration. Then there were a set of social issues that came up at the meetings. And I'm just laying these out because they came up. Yeah, one, is, one, one was the role of the landmen who were trying to get people to lease the land. The third was the undercutting of local government authority. Third were changes in rents and four were an increase in social conflict as a result. Now, the, I'm just laying these out because these are environmental and social impacts that need to be considered as well. Uh, I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, there are a couple of issues from a technology viewpoint I can address. Uh, water is an issue. Uh, in the U.S. so far, we can find the water to frack, so that has not been. There are there have been certain cases where uh, availability of water has been an issue. Going international, uh, Europe and some of the countries uh, which is which are looking at shale uh, fracking with that much water is going to be an issue. We don't have to use water. We can use. You know, I was talking to Carlos this morning. We have technology to frack with CO2, uh, which also the shale will absorb. So it's one way is to uh, sequester CO2, if you want to call it. We can do that. We can, in, 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 in New York, uh, before they banned it and now they're really looking at it, uh, they allowed us to use only very limited amount of water where we have done a uh, couple of fracks using what we call 90 quality foams, essentially 90% nitrogen, 10% water. Uh, why doesn't why is it not used 
everywhere because water is cheap it is abundant if it is not available there are other technologies available that can be used now in the second thing is uh, again in the marcellus which is pennsylvania new york area uh, in in pennsylvania for example there are no disposal wells so you cannot dispose of the water so a lot of the operators are recycling the water there are technologies available to recover the water you can recycle it and refract with it uh, so that is being practiced in a lot of areas texas west texas uh, so th the technologies are available if it becomes cost effective operators will use it uh, now the social uh, i let uh, carlos address the socio economic <laughs> things except to say now pennsylvania for example i saw some statistics that i believe i might be wrong in the number close to 25% of the state revenues are coming from shale related taxes whether it is royalties or so to answer your question when the money is coming in potentially the government can spend it on infrastructure the second thing in pennsylvania that is happening which is which i'm sure a lot of you have read is for example dow chemical and uh, there's one more chemical company i cannot think of right away they were planning to move petrochemical they were planning to build petrochemical operations in korea i believe and because of the availability of cheap natural gas in marcellus they have decided to build petrochemical plants in pennsylvania which they have not which the industry has not done in over 50 years which is going to create a lot of jobs uh, which pennsylvania apparently needs okay that's my comment if i may follow up uh, uh, no technology or no change comes without impact right and and, and uh, let me start first of all your first statement if you allow me it, it left a little uh, negative uh, flavor and so I don't remember it exactly, but it, uh, it was something along the lines that uh, accidents were meant to happen and, and they had to happen. And okay, but uh, um, uh, wonderful citation, but let me say that, uh, um, in fact, in most cases, accidents do not happen. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that puts a little, I think that that puts a more positive uh, tone to the conversation. And that is also the case in the case of uh, hydraulic fracturing of shales. Now, challenging technology, the space shuttle, we saw two failures out of 400 missions. Nuclear power plants, three out of 480. Uh, some of them have very high probability of failure, 1%. That is not the case in this uh, system. It's much, much lower. Um, uh, so that is, on the one hand, the technological part. Um, the second one is how do we reach equilibrium with a new technology? Just to walk away from the issue for a second, let's see how are we going to reach equilibrium with our iPhones and our alienation to technology. And, and, and I face it in class when my, my students begin looking at their phone instead of listening to me. It's probably rightfully so, but, uh, uh, but uh, so there is a new technology and we have to say how are we going to reach equilibrium. The fact is that we, need, uh, we have huge energy demands in this country, 11 kilowatts per person. That's the rate at which we consume energy every single second of our lives. Um, uh, how are we going to satisfy it? Um, so there are not too many options out there at the cost that we can afford it. And that being said, there are many people who are doing it. They have a better quality of life with one third of the energy we consume. So that's one path. But if we are not going to take that path, we have to recognize that there will be choices that we have to make. Now, it is very important that groups like yours remain active because they are very stimulating. They are very stimulating not only for the political sector of the country, but also for the industrial sector and the academic sector. So we welcome your thoughts and opinions. I'm reflecting what I had heard all summer. So this is not necessarily coming from me as an individual, but from the sense of the meetings that I had attended. Thank you. In any case, thank you. 
How are you doing, sir? Uh, my question is about the water use. Is it possible to use uh, seawater since it's uh, in abundance? And uh, does it damage the instruments? Or what have you thought about that? No, you can use seawater. Actually, uh, for Eagleford Shale, which is in South Texas, they are looking at potentially running pipeline from the Gulf. Uh, for, for I mean, as you saw, most of the shale is on land away from the sea. Uh, potentially, th there are uh, in, in, in uh, North Dakota, in the Balkan, for example, there is a underground, I don't know the right word is sea, but a salt water zone that we can produce from that and use it for fracturing potentially. Uh, the technology has to be modified slightly. The additives have to be changed slightly. But if you have seawater available, yes, we can use seawater. We do fracturing, uh, not of shales, uh, 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 for frack packing uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and North Sea with seawater. So we, we can do that if it is available in the shale location. There's a uh, follow-on question from the uh, webcast participant regarding seismic issues. Uh, so if I could. The uh, Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission has halted injection of disposal fluids in some locations due to seismic uh, activity. Uh, would you care to comment? No, that is in line with what we said before, and that is that is a good example. And uh, um, um, and I can tell you that the same things are happening, for example, in the geothermal area. So um, large volumes, high injection pressures uh, will destabilize systems that are uh, stressed uh, near equilibrium, near failure. This may seem like a strange question, but you said that if, if we go forward with it or continue to, there's a 20-year supply, I think you said, I, I can't rem or 60-year. I can't remember exactly how much. But I, I'm curious how many wells can be drilled in any one place. Is there the possibility of over-fracturing a site? Um, be, you know, because you look at uh, that's, that's interesting. who regulates that. The, the, OK, right now, uh, it, it, is, it is based on uh, typically, the wells are drilled uh, 40 or 80 acre uh, apart. Uh, one of the, uh, that's why we are, you know, doing this horizontal fracturing, so you don't go to the next uh, block, if you want to call it. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are doing multi-stage fracturing. Uh, we are doing, you know, technologies. What is, you know, I mean. A year ago, we could do only maybe 25 stages. Now we are doing 40 plus stages. Uh, but we also know that we are producing, on the average, only from 20% of the stages, 80% of the production is coming from. And, and we also know from our knowledge of fracturing tight gas wells, for example, in Colorado, uh, you can refract these wells because you don't reach the whole area. So the stresses change as you start producing. You can refracture it and get new production actually. And in Colorado, we have done trifracts. And not only refracts, we have fracked the wells third time over a period of time. So here, we are not there yet. So you might not have to drill more wells. You might go back once the technology is there for you to refrag these wells selectively or identify which zones are producing and which zones are not producing and produce from them. And we are talking about some technology advancement which needs to come, and it will come. The, 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 we are a service company. The, the, the oil companies or the energy companies, they own the property. When the production goes down, they will look at revitalizing it, refracking it, redrilling it, or abandoning it. Because it, it's their property, so they want to produce more. Thank you. Um, excellent work. Um, a lot of research, obviously, a lot of efforts went behind it. 
coming from the industry, I just wanted to recap on a few issues. What's going to drive the market of shell gas formation is to look in the right formation. That's where you're going to find it abundantly, and you're going to find it freely. It's, it's going to be flowing at the right specific yields. All of the initial exploration and subsequent uh, hydraulic fracturing has been done in resilient aquifers, and that is the key to finding shale gas in, in the market and drive it on the market. Thank you. Hi. Um, you had mentioned the uh, fugitive methane emissions, and I'm wondering if there's a way to recover those because with a lot of things that would be considered waste, but with a potent greenhouse gas, that sounds to me like a, it greatly lowers the balance of carbon benefits that you get from using natural gas versus other uh, things. Is there is there an economic way to uh, reduce the fugitive emissions of methane? I think that with the proper uh, fracking job that uh, keeps seals in place uh, and a cement job that prevents leaks along the, the, uh, the drill, you can begin reducing that percentage to, to an acceptable level. Otherwise, if it is diffuse uh, in the area that you cover, and some of these wells now, the pads are, are every 600 acres, uh, or potentially, uh, then it becomes very difficult to recapture something that is so diffuse. Hello, I'm from the northern part of Pennsylvania, and I was so back home for my 50th high school reunion. And um, uh, the thing I, I, I point out is first is that um, our area is not pristine to start with. The people, local people, had to make money, and so they were running meth labs, other kinds of drugs, and so we already had problems to start with. So having the uh, natural gas industry there is a legalized form, and so therefore, you know, the jobs are are legitimate. Uh, <laughs> So that's one thing people forget is the fact that the uh, that people you know are going to resort in order to stay where they are in order they're going to resort to different ways of making money they always have over the years and so now we have it as a uh, natural gas as far as a you know um, a taxable uh, legal form makes it easier the neat thing for us is that we already had a DuPont plant there and so DuPont is now sees a reason to expand and we also have a, a electrical gentrification. Um, station going in. The stress on the roads, uh, the trucks are limited to uh, only to the state highways. And then the state, has the, they have a contract with them, so the roads have actually gotten better. Okay. Because Pennsylvania is notorious for having, you know, Pottsylvania. And so um, uh, that part has uh, helped out also. Um, the thing that you're looking at basically is there's always going to be change um, when I, I teach physics, okay. And um, when it's called, uh, I call it a hog trough uh, mentality. Is that the, when you are raising hogs, the uh, hogs have a spot on their, on the, when you put the food out, and the new hog is the one that's always forced out. And so the new hog has to do something in order to be you know, allowed to eat, or otherwise it's going to starve to death. And so we accept the old hogs for all their bad habits, but we find it hard to accept the new hog for any kind of bad habit. Thank you. Yes, I was curious if the um, the fracking that you're doing in the uh, say the Marcellus uh, shale is uh, very similar to the uh, fracking done in the oil shale in the Bakken. Uh, slightly different. Uh, Marcellus is uh, much uh, okay. Bakken is much deeper than Marcellus. So Marcellus typically we do. Uh, the fluids are slightly different. Uh, the Marcellus is mainly slick water. Uh, we don't use cross-link fluid at all because gas is you don't need as much conductivity for gas compared to liquids. Bakken is liquids, so you need a little bit more conductivity. So we do what we call hybrid fluids. We start out with low viscosity and go to a little higher viscosity towards the end so you get better conductivity for the fracture. So oil can flow a little easier. But horsepower-wise, everything else is very similar. My question is back to the sociology and politics of the situation. I have two really quick 
different questions. One is that you mentioned in particular um, that there had been federal incentives to uh, look for tight gas and so Not on. No, we used to have it in the late 80s. I just wondered what your perspective in general is on the role of federal subsidies for various kinds of energy in this country. I mean, if we're going to develop a portfolio of different kinds of energy, tight gas, all sorts of other kinds of gas, do, do you think that, that there's a role for federal subsidies for other kinds of energy or just for the ones that you are involved in? As far as I know, now there is no incentive of any kind in the in the, in the, in the in the gas industry at all. But, but there's a question about whether or not we ought to be providing subsidies in, in other fields. Answer. So I'm interested in that. The other question is more technical question or sociological, and that is I, I'm curious to understand just a little bit better about what's left when the trucks go. In other words, are, are there still jobs? Uh, what, what, you, you got all those trucks there, you know, those great pictures of, you know, 25 oh, but, big but, trucks but, and all that kind of stuff. When they leave, when they move, when all this mobile equipment leaves, do no. all the jobs go, and no, what no, about no. the ground, and you know, okay. just sort of what's the okay. residue of the process? Okay. Uh, the, when we do the fracturing, we bring our people, our equipment, do the work. After the frac job, we are gone. But then the pro producer is still there, so the gas is still produced, and then there is processing of the gas, and then there is pipeline-related activities. All that is there. In terms of the frac job, we come, we do our frac job, when we leave, there shouldn't be anything left on location. That is correct. Fracturing is fracturing is a mobile, correct. But once it's done, there is some minor activity to maintain the production. Now, let me go back to your first question. Uh, I'll give you an example from a slightly different area, methane hydrates. This is like ice in the bottom of the ocean, typically or um, in, in permafrost, that uh, is full of methane. It's uh, methane hydrate. Um, we know that there is plenty of that around all the continents. However, it is so complex that in order to get a real program, experimental program, prototype, it would cost probably three, five billion dollars. While the industry is making that money per quarter, some of the large companies, they are not ready to invest on an experimental project, which by the way may fail, and create a, a, a political catastrophe and, and, and a, a perception catastrophe for the industry. So if we as a country feel that producing methane hydrates in this case is a path that we would like to follow, we will have to depend on federal government seeding those projects to provide the confidence for industry to follow up afterwards. So yes, there is in certain roles, there is a role for the government to play, and that is uh, the strategizing uh, should be way beyond the four-year political cycle. And I hope we have politicians that have such a view and perspective to do so. The, the question was, why is there hostility to federal subsidies for other forms of energy? I let you answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching it. Well, there's one. Uh, we're about out of time here. Let me uh, share with you one question, one more question from uh, a webcast participant. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently regarding confirmations of reserves in the Utica Shale, which underlies the Marcellus Shale. Good Can you question. comment on the prospects of the Utica Shale? Good question. Uh, that is the next shale to be explored and the Utica shale I don't know uh, if you guys saw it's it's uh, much deeper than the Marcellus and uh, it runs uh, from what I remember all the way from Kentucky to uh, Quebec and uh, north it's much deeper uh, it's it is I think very recently, in the last two weeks, somebody did an experimental well and found, uh, if I remember right, uh, some liquids as well as gas. Uh, that will happen, but it might be four to five years away. Uh, if, if they find liquids, I think it will happen sooner. If it is pure gas, right now we, are, we have abundant gas, so I don't know if it will, but that is, it is there. 
as well as i mean in this part of the country as you saw there is a shale and black barrier basin deeper than the coal bed which is still uh, to be explored and produced from it's a question of uh, cost of gas versus infrastructure and the need for yeah utica is uh, something people are looking at let's uh, thank our distinguished speakers for the presentation <laughs> And just one, one, one reminder, be sure to circle your calendars for November 16th for our next program, which will be on nuclear power. Thank you.